I'm Brandon Scroggins, a pastor here at Reformation Baptist Church, and we are so thankful that you've stopped here to check out the content, which is such a central part of the life of our church. We truly believe that there is hope for you right now in Christ. At RBC, we believe that it's vital to worship God, to disciple one another, and to be a witness to the world, to pierce every area of life, every nation and generation with the good news of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We believe that it's essential to teach sound doctrine in the context of our homes through family worship, and then to gather in corporate worship on the Lord's day and as we can throughout the week as well. You see, at the heart of man's need is the exposition of God's holy word, taking one passage and one verse at a time, understanding it the way God intended it, and then applying it to the whole of life. The content here is made available to church members who are providentially hindered from joining us in person at the time. But it's so vital that you stay connected to the life and leadership of the church. But this content is also made available for anyone else outside of our church that would find it helpful. But we want you to know that as glad as we are that you stopped here and are joining us online, I am not yet your pastor and we are not yet your local church. Scripture teaches that it's vital that every person know Christ and then for every believer to be anchored in physical presence into the life of the local church, submitting themselves under the care of faithful, qualified pastors who can shepherd your soul. So I want to encourage you to find and join a local church, if possible, a solid Reformed Baptist church. And if you're not already a part of a faithful, biblical local church, we want to encourage you to come and join us in person as soon as possible. We pray that the content here is a blessing to your soul. The glory be to Christ. God bless you. We have had and continue to have quite a few precious babies born to families in our church. And so I want to point out in Ezra chapter 7, moms and dads, you have a wealth of about 20 different names if you're looking for a name for your child now, I don't know if you've ever thought about Artaxerxes, but if that's not on your radar for a good boy name, maybe a HeTube or Sariah or just a lot of options, and we're going to look at all of them. The title of my sermon this morning is A Heart Resolved. A Heart Resolved, and as I study this passage, there's so much to an earth that really I don't think needs to be skipped over, so we may need to come back here before we move any farther since the fall of man and all the more in our own day, it's very clear that we live now in a time when our hearts are very much divided. They're divided, they're compromising. In many ways, our hearts can be flighty and fickle. There's so many things that can be important to us, things that we think that we have to have today, but then we don't even give them a second thought tomorrow. The fear of missing out on something better can create so many competing claims on our time. We can have our hearts completely fixed on a particular aspect of our lives that has no absolute long-term value, much less short-term or much less rather eternal value. Have you ever paid attention to the national public polling on any major issue? Oftentimes it shifts like the wind, depending on the day. Calvin said that the human heart is an idol factory. And what we see in this text is something that we again need to recover, and that is a long line of godly men who had their hearts set, firmly fixed and resolved on the things in life that matter. We need these examples before us, and what we need more than anything else, is twice repeated in the first 10 verses of chapter 7, which is the good hand of the Lord our God upon us and our lives. As we approach Ezra chapter 7, we've seen God exile his people through a pagan nation due to their sin. We've seen God stir up all of heaven and earth to bring them back to their land, to restore the right worship and witness of God, for God to display his grace in and through their lives to the nations. We've come now to a significant turning point in the book of Ezra. 
I would argue the most significant turning point in the book of Ezra. If you recall and you've been with us, you've seen the first wave of exiles return to Jerusalem in the opening chapters of Ezra. We've seen Shesh Bazar, a sort of mysterious figure. We've seen the governor, Zerubbabel. We've seen Jeshua, the priest. And we've seen through many trials and tribulations, they and we enter the kingdom of God. We've watched starts and stops to the work and the promises of God. And finally, we've seen after 21 years from Ezra 3 to the end of Ezra 6, they finally completed and dedicated the temple of God. Right worship has been restored. Sacrifices are being given. And finally, once again, that sacred Passover festival is being celebrated where they're remembering the Lamb of God that was slain and the blood that was put on the doorpost as God's people were delivered out of the first exile from Egypt into an exodus into the promised land. And they're looking eagerly toward that one Lamb who would come and take away all of their sins, that Lamb upon which we feed this morning in response to God's Word through the Lord's Supper. Look with me in Ezra chapter 6, verse 22, as we shift from the sermon text from last week to this morning. We saw, having built this temple, celebrated the Passover, now they are reminded that God had decreed and directed all of this through the means of human hands and kings. And we ended last week with verse 22 in chapter 6. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. How many days, children? Seven days. And how did they do it, children? With joy. For the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them so that he aided them in the work of the house of their God, the God of Israel. This is a time of reflection, a time of celebration. This is a time when God had turned their fortunes, he had established their hearts, and he had filled it with the joy of the Lord. It's often pointed out that happiness tends to happen. It comes and goes with the wind, depending on the circumstances of the moment. But God can fix joy, and he does fix joy in the midst of his people's souls to trust him and know that ultimately, even if there's chaos around us, all is well when we're right in the middle of the hands of God. Well, I want you to turn with me to Psalm 96. There are a couple of psalms that are attributed historically to this time period to the dedication of the original tabernacle and first temple, and then the second. Most of the Psalms are very difficult to nail down historically when they were penned. But also the church has oftentimes attributed certain Psalms to certain eras. And one of the Psalms oftentimes attributed to this dedication of the temple is Psalm 96. You can hear the shouts going out as they would possibly sing many of the psalms. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name, RBC. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But who made the heavens? The Lord did. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. This is what they're doing. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. 
If you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. Let the field exalt and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness. Turn with me to one other psalm, Psalm 126. Psalm 126 could be a testament to what God's doing in their hearts and on this side of the cross in our hearts as well. You can only envision when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, which he had turned the tide, he had sent them out of exile, he had delivered them from the miry clay, from the pit, and he had set their feet on solid ground. And it says that when he did, we were like those who dream. Then our mouths were, was filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of what? Shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things. Has the Lord done great things in your life? Has he reversed your fortunes? Has he rescued from the pit? Has he delivered you from despair? Has he saved you and put hope in your life? Has he given you purpose and brand new direction? Has he given his spirit within you? Has he shown himself strong and faithful to, in and through your life? Has he proved that you can trust him? Has he proved that he is worthy of all of your affection and adoration and glory? Praise him. Be joyful before him. God has done great things in your life. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negeb. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of what? Shouts of joy. This is a place of gladness, bringing his sheaves with him. So as we conclude what we know of as chapter six in the book of Ezra, this is the tone. This is where they are. This is what they're celebrating and reflecting on. And so, so ought we at times in our life. But we also, if you'll look back with me at the end of Ezra 6, we're also concluding a very rare section in the Bible, a section which began in Ezra chapter 4, verse 18, which would have originally been written in Aramaic and now comes to a conclusion as the Hebrew pen is picked back up and we'll see another short section of that original language in Ezra. But we also conclude the first major return back to Jerusalem. And then there's a long silence between the end of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7. And then we're picking up in chapter 7 with a brand new beginning. And in this fresh start, we're finally meeting the man whom this book is named after. After six chapters, we're introduced to Ezra himself. Chapter 7 and 8 introduce the man. He's a scholar priest. He has a mission and an expedition before him. He'll lead the second wave of exiles to return back and rebuild from the ruins. But having seen the man, this will then set up the rest of the book of Ezra and we'll see chapters 9 and 10 and we'll begin to unpack the mission of this man, qualified and called by God. He'll be sent not only to rebuild the ruins, but he'll be sent to confront moral disarray in the midst of pagan intermarriage among his people, he'll be sent to know the law and then apply it to the lives of his people. This section appears to de detail Ezra's personal account, words such as I and we, drawing from direct records from what appears to be his own pen. So as we look at the big picture of this passage, Ezra 1 through 6 is laying out that first wave of, of those who would return. And then Ezra 7 through 10 will lay out an entirely different and second wave of people who would return. And then it'll take the book of Nehemiah to record that third and final wave of people whom God would call back to rebuild. As we come to Ezra 7, 1 through 10, I want you to notice with me two, two points. Number one, in verses 1 through 6, we see a godly heritage, a long line of godly men. 
In verses 7 through 10, we move from a godly heritage to a resolved heart. Number two, we see a heart set on God's word. Look with me at number one, a godly heritage where we will probably spend the majority of our time this morning. See a long line of godly men. Look with me in verse one. Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, which some scholars believe would be a second Artaxerxes, but more likely it would be the first, who ruled from 464 to 423. Here's what's interesting. Look with me in your Bible. Put your, put your finger on the page or on your screen, and I want you to point with one finger, your left hand, if you have that many hands available, parents, on verse 22. If you would, put your right finger on chapter 7, verse 1, and then look at the space in between. In between those two verses, we have 57 years of silence that unfold from the time that the temple was rededicated and consecrated and the Passover was celebrated. 57 years unfold and we jump right into chapter 7 as we're introduced to Ezra and his lineage. Before we can move any farther and think about any practical application, I want us to take just a few moments and get our hands on the kings and to get a handle on the time period and the context before us. We began Ezra with King Cyrus of Assyria. He conquered King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and God stirred him up to release and support God's people And he would rule from 539 to 530. In Ezra, we then skip completely over two kings, Cambyses and Pseudo-Smerdes, not even mentioned, and we come to the rule of King Darius. That's where we have spent much of our time in Ezra. Darius, or Darius, ruled from 522 to 486. We see him, if you'll look with me, in Ezra chapter 4, verse 5. After Darius is mentioned, we then are given a 100-year period snapshot of the future of the persecution that Israel would face, and then we return right back to his reign at the end of Ezra chapter 4 and verse 23. And then if you'll look with me in Ezra chapter 6 verse 14, we see the reigns of Cyrus and Darius, and then we look forward later to the reign of Artaxerxes, all of these who are responsible for the building of God's temple. But the question before we move forward to understand as good students of the Bible where we are and what God's doing, the question is what happened in this nearly 60-year time period that unfolds from one verse to the next that we hear nothing about? It's amazing how you can flip one page to the other and you can flip the time period that the United States of America was in existence. In the case before us, you flip one verse and you skip an entire generation. We see a snapshot of the persecution and hostility that is coming against God as they're doing the very things that he called them to do in Ezra chapter 4. But what else is going on here? I at least want to note it. What's happening and unfolding? We've already seen the book of Haggai unfold at the beginning of Ezra 5. And then in this silence unfolding is the book of none other than Esther. How many of you love the book of Esther? One of the greatest books of the Bible. We're going to have to go through Haggai and Esther before this is over. But look with me in Esther chapter 4 starting in verse 7, and let's fill in a little bit of the gap before we continue on this journey with where Ezra is taking us. In Esther chapter 4, you need to retell these stories to your children. It's true accounts that unfold God's work of redemption for his people. Starting in verse 7, you'll remember in In Esther chapter 4, verse 7, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. They're trying to annihilate all of God's people. Haman has set this plot. 
the king has listened to this wicked counsel. And now it's gotten back to the ears of God's people, Mordecai and then Esther, who are close to the royal court. You remember the story. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree and issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hatak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, I mean, can you only imagine the way that this is unfolding and if we were actually there, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Famous words are coming and you know it. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. As God's people are being attacked, it would be so easy to turn a blind eye and say, you know what, I don't want to be involved in this mess. But you don't involve yourself in the messiness of the situation and don't discount that you'll be there next. For if you keep silent at this time, God will use something else. Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom. Here it is. For such a time as this. Then Ezra told them to replay to Mordecai. Go. Gather all the Jews to be found in Susa. And hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. They're on their faces, desperate for God to intervene. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. What happens when you're doing the will of God And the bombs begin to explode and the missiles go off and the persecution and the attack comes. And it could be that it's not a sign that you're out of the will of God. It could be a sign that you're actually right over the target. (laughs) Right over the target. When the bombs start flying, God's people are oftentimes right over the target in spiritual warfare and the gates of hell are coming against them. But time and time again, God is preserving his people for his own glory and showing them that they can trust in him. Whether it's Ezra or Ezra or or, or Esther or whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's where we are. But I want you to turn back with me. Let's enter back into Ezra. Let's save Esther for another day. It's during this time period, for you history buffs, you may be interested to know that scholars say the battles of Marathon and Thermopylae and so many mighty exploits would take place. But I want us to zero our attention where the text is taking us. Look at with me at Ezra chapter 7, verse 1. Because Ezra is pressing a point, or the author thereof, and we need to follow him and where he's taking us. In Ezra chapter 1, we see Ezra, the son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitu, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Marioth, son of Zariah, son of Uzai, son of Bukai, son of Abishuai, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. It will be a miracle if I pronounce half of those correctly. Always confident, sometimes right. You say, you've got to be kidding me. We did this for 70 verses through three sermons in Ezra chapter 2. 
And you're fixing to give us a list of 17 names again? Are we really fixing to do this? To which I would remind you that you often tell me that every word of God is inspired and profitable for his people. And I will remind you that even the genealogies are. Even the genealogies are. So why is this important? Why are we being told this? God, what is there for my soul in these names? And do I have to endure walking through all of these foreign figures? What he is doing is establishing the credentials and the legitimacy of Ezra. He's establishing that he has come from a priestly line and he is qualified for the mission that God is putting before him. And then we'll see the qualifications of Ezra from even the pagan king who had sent him in the weeks ahead. But what he is establishing is that he has come from the tribe of Levi. He is qualified and providentially raised up by God and can legitimate his genealogy. Look with me in Ezra chapter 2, verse 62. Do you remember that those who, there were those who wanted to be counted among the priests? And they couldn't verify that they came from the right family line of God's prescribed line of Levi and the priests. And they couldn't verify that, so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean, and they weren't allowed to go. They were that serious about following the prescriptions and the laws that God had laid out. One thing, if nothing else, is clear to me, and that is this. There was obviously no diversity, equity, and inclusivity training for the people in the book of Ezra. And they clearly were not familiar with DEI and ESG scores <laughs> because they're excluding people left and right. They're doing things that really we just need to be inclusive and include everyone by default. But the Bible is saying no to be registered at priests. You have to do this the way that God prescribes. And so we're seeing this lineage and we're seeing a long line of godly men with faithful examples for us to learn from. 16 of these ancestors of Ezra are mentioned here. 16, and then we see many of their lives unfold in other places. We're entering here a land of giants and the stories of these giants have to be retold from one generation to another. He's setting us up in Ezra chapter 7 to the edge of our seats, and he's telling us, if you'll wait just a moment, I'm cueing you that something massive is fixing to happen. You are on the break of something astonishing, and I want you to just walk with me to that place. And friends, it's a reminder as we enter this land of giants that we do not need more con artists. We don't need more compromisers. We don't need more charismatic gurus. We don't need more slicksters. We need men who know and love God. We need churches who want God's word and his law faithfully unfolded before us so that we can be nourished in it and then go live it out in our lives. Enter a line of men who gave their lives for this to a life of faithfulness, sparking revival, centering upon studying, doing, and teaching the scriptures. Verse one, Ezra, the son of Sariah. The first explicit name of Ezra's, Ezra's name, his family tree in scripture. His presence will dominate chapters seven through 10 for good reason. The name Ezra is a shortened form of Azariah that's also mentioned in the text. And ironically, his name means the Lord has helped. And like you and I, he would need the help of the Lord greatly in his life. Jewish tradition would designate uh, Ezra as a second Moses. Having been taken in a second exodus, leading out of that exile to return God's people to their place. He would clarify the meaning of God's law and impress it on their hearts and lives. He's the son of Sariah, and the word son of do not always mean a direct son, but oftentimes we refer to a distant descendant. 
We're watching generations unfold, and he's picking out touch points to guide us through this genealogy. Sariah was the chief priest about 130 years before, killed by the very hands of King Nebuchadnezzar. He was also Jeshua's grandfather who had served with Zerubbabel. And then we see the son of Azariah. It means the Lord has help. We'll see this name mentioned again later. We see this same genealogy in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, but it is notoriously difficult to trace out. Because most of these names are only mentioned in genealogies and not all of the ones in Ezra are mentioned in 1 Chronicles 6. But I want to show you some snapshots. Look with me next at another great, great, great grandfather. He was also the son of Hilkiah. The son of Hilkiah is unbelievably, unbelievable. It's striking. Who is Hilkiah? If you'll note 2 Kings chapter 22, this was the high priest who served during the time of King Josiah. Before King Josiah lifted his finger to make those reforms and revivals that we may remember, they were repairing the temple of God. The people were giving offerings. And as this construction is going on, all of a sudden, Hilkiah the high priest found something that was very noteworthy. He found, get the irony, okay? Buried underneath the house of God, he, he found buried a copy of the book of the law of God. And he unearthed that copy. He presents it to King Josiah. He reads it to the king, and the king, recovering God's law, shreds himself, humbles himself, and then he begins reform throughout the entire nation as revival breaks out, as God's word and his law is thundered once again throughout the land before the people. If ever we lived in a day where the law and word of God had been lost in the very house of God, tell me, friends, surely that would be this day. I just want to be honest with you. Sometimes I feel like I have to go to a Roman Catholic church just to hear the scriptures publicly read in service. It's unbelievable. We are the guardians of this truth. We are the stewards of this law. And if it would be lost anywhere, it ought not be lost here. And when it's recovered, it brings revival to the land with God's blessing and his spirit. And it's happened again and again and again. Verse 2, son of Shalom. Someone that we know very little about, mentioned elsewhere. And then we see also, if you'll follow with me, son of Zadok. Zadok was a priest under King David. He was made a priest under Solomon. But Abiathar defected with Solomon's brother Adonijah. They were trying to usurp the throne to press their own will against the will of God. He was the last descendant of Eli, Abiathar was, to occupy that position. Solomon put Zadok in the position of priest, and then his descendants would occupy that position for 800 years. 800 years. I'm just going to be honest with you. Most of the time, it's hard for us to think beyond what's going to happen today. You got any plans tomorrow night? I don't know that I have plans tonight. Can we just get through now? <laughs> any of you relate? Can you go to lunch next week? Maybe if we could get through tomorrow. But consider a generational worldview. Consider the legacy of faithfulness that God can bring from men and women who began to follow God and honor him and inscribe his truths on his children's hearts, consider generations that can be affected for better or for worse. We have to get beyond thinking beyond today and this year. What is God potentially going to do in the next five generations through what we're doing today? What might God do if we would continue to just be faithful to his promises? 
He provided a he too, who's mentioned elsewhere in genealogy, and then also the son of Amariah. Amariah is the high priest who's mentioned in 2 Chronicles 19, or at least that name is. It's when the king had gathered together the Levites and the priests and the family heads. The king charged these men to judge cases in the fear of God. He called them to faithfulness with a whole heart to take God's law and to judge the people righteously for their own flourishing and good. And there's Amariah present as he's calling on the king to, as the king is calling on the people to deal courageously. If you continue to follow me, we see the son of Azariah, a name that's also mentioned elsewhere. It's mentioned in 1 Chronicles 6 as a priest in Solomon's temple. If you'll continue to follow me, we pick up with the son of Marioth, and then we find four other names that are just mentioned in other lists that we know little about. And then we end up coming to the son of Phineas. Who is this man and what is he known for? Anyone ever heard of a man by the name of Phineas? Phineas was Aaron's grandson. In Numbers chapter 25, verses 7 through 11, we find that Balaam couldn't outright curse Israel from the outside. So his teaching would begin to seduce them from the inside. The men of Israel began to take Midianite wives and they became unequally yoked with pagans. Now, dads, I want to just let you know I'm going, my, I'm going to try my best to keep this G or at least PG, but there is a rated R version of this that you can find in Numbers chapter 25. And in his zeal for the Lord, seeing this interyoking, interyoking with pagans, Phineas went into the tent of a son of Israel who had been yoked to a daughter of Midian in the midst of 24,000 Israelites who were struck dead under the plague of God. And Phineas intervenes to stop the plague by sticking a javelin through these individuals. Here is a man who is given to the holiness of God and the salvation of God's people, and God intervened. He stopped the plague, and he provided mercy through the means of this servant. A long line of faithful men. Brings us next to the son of Eleazar. Another story that has to be told. He's the third son of Aaron. Do you remember the first two sons of Aaron? Men by the name of Nadab and Abihu. If you want to read that account, look in Leviticus 10. But what they did was these first two sons offered strange, unauthorized fire before God in worship. They decided that they would take the worship of God into their own hands and that they would regulate the way that they would worship God. And God consumed them in his judgment. And Eleazar would become the high priest after his father Aaron died. He would serve to the end of Moses' life and he would be faithful throughout the entire reign of Joshua who would lead that, that second and really another exodus in a long line of faithfulness. And then we come to son of Aaron. Aaron was the brother of Moses. He was the first to be designated by God as the high priest. Now we make our way all the way back to the source, his lineage finding itself in the original high priest. His great-grandfather would have been Levi, one of the original 12 tribes of Israel. What a tremendous heritage that we have before us. Leviticus chapter 10, God told Aaron, your job is to distinguish before the people that which is holy and then teach them all of my laws that were given by Moses. And God would show himself to his people through his law. He would rule his people through his law. He would show his judgments throughout the world. His law was a reflection of his very character. 
But ironically, speaking of the priesthood and the law, Moses would be up on the mountain receiving the law of God from God's very own hands. And Mr. Aaron would be at the bottom of that mountain helping them turn from his law and serve other gods as Moses was receiving it. Before the, war, before the ink is even dry, they've already broke all of them. This is in your family history. But God would show mercy in his judgment. He would show his grace that would come through Jesus Christ and he would set Aaron apart to offer for sin and to instruct the people. And God would show his mercy through generations to raise them up for his own purposes. And as you look at these names in Ezra 7, you see surrounded Surrounding them, the good, the bad, and you see the ugly. You say, what if, what if I have a godly heritage? Some of you have a very godly heritage. And the truth is, if you're in Christ, we all do. Because Jesus Christ is our elder brother. and Jesus Christ has adopted us into his family we have a rich heritage. But others of you very much have a more immediate godly heritage of mothers and fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers. And I want all of our children to look up, up, up here at me right now. I want you to understand something that you cannot see right now. God has blessed you with mothers and fathers, grandparents, someone in your family that deeply loves you. You are growing up radically different than many of the people in this congregation and most of the world. God has, God has blessed you with the opportunity to be born into a Christian family, to live your life under the word of God and to know no different. How many of you were born into a family like that with generational faithfulness? Don't take that for granted. Ezra didn't. You shouldn't. You should praise God for the people that he has put in your life to have you in church, to teach you to love Jesus Christ. And you should also know that you will be responsible. You will be held accountable for the heritage that God has given to you, to be faithful with that, to let none of his words fall to the ground. Others of you and many of us say, what if I have a ruined heritage? I don't have any of this kind of stuff in my family tree. And the truth is, in the big picture of things, we all have a ruined heritage because we all have Adam as our first father who plunged us into sin and wrecked the lives of the entire world into depravity. But some of, some of you may be thinking, I didn't have a mom or a dad, grandma, grandfather. We had to begin to reverse course. We had to begin to figure these things out. God had to begin to change things with us. We didn't have these examples. And it's amazing to me that Scripture is replete with examples of men and women who stepped up to the plate, who humbled themselves before God and who changed generational curses in their family and changed everything for the generations that would follow from them. And God can reach into the worst of families and do just that today. Welcome to the family tree of Jesus, which is polluted with the most vile of sinners who have been redeemed by him Welcome to the family of Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. Abraham's father was an idolater. Deuteronomy 7 says, I didn't choose you based on your own pedigree, but you were the least of all peoples. I chose you to highlight my grace and glory in you. 1 Corinthians 1 says, Not many of you when called were of noble pedigree, but God chooses the least to do the most. Let's keep moving. Look with me in Ezra chapter seven. See, one more verse. One more verse, chapter six. 
This Ezra, the one that we have spent the last five verses in the last 45 minutes unpacking, it was this man who went up from Babylonia. Verse six says that he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given him. And the king granted him all that he asked for. The hand of the Lord his God was on him. I want you to note a skilled scribe in verse 6. It's been nearly 60 years. There have been many people who didn't come back with the first wave. They're still in Babylon. And then you have an entire generation that's arose from the end of chapter 6, and you have what appears to be possibly a famine by this point, maybe of hearing God's word, and God is raising up this skilled scribe to water the souls of his people. He's a skilled scribe. The word skilled or ready in the King James means a quickness of grasp, an ease of movement. It would come from his calling and all of his devoted study. It's a word that would be used of the wisdom and experience that high court officials would have. It appears that Ezra could have served as a sort of presidential pointee, if you will, a sort of court secretary, having access to the king. But the word scribe itself would move from being more than just a state secretary or some sort of clerk or private royal secretary. The word scribe would come to refer to someone who would read, interpret, and then write the laws of God for his people. It would be one who studies, interprets, and copies scripture, and it gives the whole of his life to it. Ezra is the pre preeminent expositor. He's well-versed in the law of God. He's scholarly. He's highly proficient to know and apply the law of God. He's not just an ivory tower theologian bringing down more information to the people, but he's seeking in his role as scribe to fill the land with the knowledge of God, not so that they could just be smarter than they were the day before, but so that they could know how to live in a way that honors God. Friends, there was a time in our country where pastors were the preeminent theologians and thought leaders for the culture and for the church. And now that has been replaced by pagan psychologists and thought leaders of every sort of secular domain. But for decades and generations, the scribes fulfilled this role because people knew that they were filled with a world of lies and competing standards, and they knew that they needed truth. Jeremiah 8 says, How can you say, We arise, and the law of the Lord is with us, but behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. Children, how many of you from time to time work on your memory verse or your catechisms? Raise your hand. Work on your memory verse. How many of us know at least a dozen memory verses? Anybody? I hope so. Jewish tradition says that very possibly Ezra didn't just participate in the verse of the month, which I'm very thankful for and I want to encourage you in. Jewish tradition would suggest that possibly Ezra had the entire Torah or Pentateuch memorized. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So what I'm suggesting from this point forward is that we don't do a verse of the month. I'm gonna suggest that we start doing a book of the month. But I'm going to let you start that and take the lead on it and not me. Well, that's a great leader, isn't it? Here's a man who is intimately familiar with the law of God. And listen to Matthew 13 about the role of a scribe. Every scribe who, who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. You know the part about every Sunday that I hate the worst? I absolutely despise this section in the service every Sunday. I know what time it is. 
I know that your, kill, your children are antsy. I know you're ready to get to lunch. But, but I also know what Matthew 13 says. A scribe is like a museum curator. He's got so much treasure that he wants to lay before the people. God's law is compared not to drudgery, but to a treasure. And here I am, I've studied all week and I've got so much treasure. Look at this. Have you seen this? Have you thought about how this changes your life? And now I, here I am up against the clock again. I got more treasures than I got time. Look at all of the treasures. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A workman who has no need to be ashamed. Rightly Handling the word of truth, taking the scriptures, understanding them in light of the whole counsel of God, and then appropriately applying them to the people in their own individual circumstances, that we may know how to please the Lord. I think it's a beautiful thing that this church would so value the word of God that you would find it important to set someone aside full time to give themselves extensively to unearthing these treasures, to studying and preaching and counseling and shepherding. Look with me in verse six. The king granted him all that he asked. We see a supportive king. The king basically gave him a blank check. And we'll look at what's on that check in verses 11 through 28. But he says, everything that I have is yours. Now take it all. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And God turns it wherever he will. And this is where we'll end. And this is the greatest treasure that I've saved for last. Not only a skilled scribe and a supportive king, but look at this last treasure, the sovereign God. For the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Now we get to the bottom of the barrel. This is the reason that this man was not only so significantly blessed in himself, but he would be a blessing that would bring a reformation to the entire world. Here's a recipe for changing the world. Study the word of God, do the word of God, teach the word of God, and keep repeating until Jesus comes. But here's the recipe for the blessing of God. The hand of the Lord his God was on him. I want you to look with me in verse 8. Verse 9, Ezra 7, verse 9, will you? And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, for the good hand of his God was on him. Verse 28. And who extended to me his steadfast love, and it says, I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was on me. Chapter 8, verse 18. And by the good hand of our God on us. Verse 22. The hand of our God is for good on all who seek him. Verse 31. The hand of our God was on us and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambushes along the way. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 8. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Verse 18. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. Friends, it would be the hand of God on Joseph's life that would cause all of the land and all of Potiphar's house to flourish. It would be the good hand of God on Ezra's life that would bring international revival. It would be meditating on the scriptures that would be a life-giving river. 
And there would be nothing more important in our lives that the good hand of God's favor and blessing would rest on our lives. One final passage and we're done. Matthew chapter five. Matthew chapter five shows us something of this blessing on our lives. What does this look like? How can we have it? What are the marks of a kingdom citizen who had the hand of God on their life? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, who have the favor of God on their life. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Are you hungry and thirsty for the things of God? I want to ask you to bow your head in a heart of prayer. God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, that has been the point of this entire genealogy to lead to the one who would fulfill the law perfectly in our place, who would bear all of its curses, who would be slaughtered for the sin that we deserve and committed, who would take all of our shame. He kept the law, and he counts us as law keepers and righteous And then he rose from the grave and he calls us, he inscribes God's law in our heart and he gives us a desire and an empowerment to live according to it. Are you hungry and thirsty for righteousness? I wanna invite you this morning to be fed not only with the word, but to be nourished with the sacrament and ordinance of the Lord's Supper. God feeds his people He brings rest to our souls. And in the Lord's Supper, we have signs that point us to him and all of his benefits. Do you believe and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Are you living or seeking to live a life of repentance? Do you want to desire to know God's word more than you do and to live according to it? Do you need assurance that you belong to God and that you didn't earn your salvation nor can you lose it? Friends, here is a tangible element to remember that God is a promise keeper. And here is a seal that gives us assurance to certify with divine authority all of the promises of adoption that God has given to us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, If you've been baptized and you're a member of this church in good standing or any other church of like and faith, like faith and practice, we want to encourage you to come to the table, forsake your sin and cling to Jesus Christ. We've covenanted together as a church family and we've read that. God has covenanted with us that we would be his people. And as we extend the hand, we rest in his promises of forgiveness and righteousness And we devote our lives to live for his glory and we trust him until he comes. Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you for your law and your word. We thank you that you intervene into the worst of families and you provide redemption. That you adopt us, that you fulfill the law for us, that you fulfill all of this. We thank you that you are the great promise keeper and all of the promises are yes in Christ. God, many people today in here have had a long week. Their souls are tired, their perspective is off, they're weary. Father, we pray that your word would enliven our hearts and that this supper would satisfy our souls. Embolden our hands for war in the coming week. God, thank you, Lord, thank you for the blessing of this wonderful meal. We pray that you set it apart for your glory and that it draw our hearts into you, that you commune with us, and we thank you for this.
In Jesus' name we pray, amen.